hi guys, it's time, so let's start. And for the few who are late, then shit happens. Thanks to be here for this talk about Ethereum. I'm Nicola Frankel. Uh, it's my third time at Geekcom. I'm a developer. Well, I, I'm a consultant, so I don't know here if you make the difference between a developer and a consultant. Um, basically, a consultant does whatever the customer asks of him. So I do, I, I do development, I do architecture, like software architecture, I do solution architecture. Uh, earlier this year, I even had to um, like install and configure a Kibana cluster, like, uh, sorry, an Elasticsearch cluster with Kibana dashboard. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, and this is very interesting, but still, I, I like to do something else. So sometimes I write books, I write blog posts, I run a marathon. Well, you know the stuff. It's very, life can be very boring, so you need to do other stuff. And um, yeah, I'm a speaker at conferences. So first, some disclaimer. Um, I'm not here as an expert. Uh, I come here because I was interested in the blockchain, because blockchain is everywhere. I was interested in the, the not really the cryptocurrency, but how uh, you could do some uh, interesting stuff on the blockchain. I'm, I, I'm not here as an expert. I'm here to have some lesson learn on my own learning path on, on the blockchain. So I, I'm not a fintech expert. Uh, I'm not a blockchain expert. I won't tell you about Merkle trees, uh, like proof of work and this kind of stuff. I will try to stay super lightweight on that. I will really try to teach you how to do stuff on the blockchain. Uh, again, I'm not an Ethereum expert. I'm just a developer. And if anybody has any like dreams of getting rich uh, after attending this talk, sorry, you can walk away. It's not the case. You won't make millions. I won't make you part of my next ICO. No hope. I, bye. <laughs> now, I understand. I understand. Some of you might, uh, you know, blockchain equals money. No, that's not true. Um, so what is a blockchain? And this is my personal definition. It's a chain of blocks. And any idiot, including myself, can understand it. Um, also, I like to do some uh, nice graphics. So for me, this is how I visualize a blockchain. So you have the first block, which has like nothing for content and a hash of something, probably zero. And then you can add blocks on top. The really important stuff is that every time you add a block, then the new block references the old one. If you think about Git, for example, like imagine a Git with no rebase, no branch, only like master. It's exactly like that. Every time you add a commit, you reference the old commit. So that's exactly the definition of the blockchain. You have content, you make a hash, you have new hash, and then you add like commits on top. So if it's Easier for you to visualize it, like think about Git and about no branching, no rebasing, no nothing. That gives you some, some nice property. Uh, the first thing is that it's immutable. So once you have written something on the blockchain, it stays there. If you had a commit in Git, it should stay there if you have no rebase. The only thing that you can do is create a new commit, which basically will be the opposite of the old one. Durability, immutability is the first property. The second property is if you do blockchain, probably right now from what I saw is that it's distributed. So everybody has the same copy of the blockchain. So if you do that on your computer, you will have the copy of the blockchain on your computer. Uh, you, you can come, there are some places left here, unless you like to be, uh, to, to, st to stand, but hey, hey, everybody who has a seat free near him can please raise his hand. Thank you. No? Okay. Too bad. Uh, third property is it's transparent. Um, that seems to be uh, pretty strange for some people, but everybody 
who does something who passes a transaction on the blockchain, well, it can be seen. So that for, uh, for example, for a voting system, it can, it can be interesting. Like, you can see what everybody voted. So blockchain is not the solution to every one of your problems. But you have those three properties. In some kind, visibility can be an advantage. Transparency can be good. It really depends. This is, I did that table perhaps three weeks ago. So it's, it's like the top 10 cryptocurrency by the market cap, which means that which one like is the most valued. We can debate about that, but for me, in the right column, everything should be zero. <laughs> this is just zero. Why? Because this is just pure speculation. Yes, we can debate, but this is speculation. It's because you believe this has value, that you give it a value, that I give it a value as well, that it has value. Like, if you have a car, it gives you, it, it, it renders a service, you can use it, yes? But dollar also is speculation, then, isn't it? Dollar is backed by the US government. And of course, if China comes back and say, hey, guys, we have a lot of debt, of your debt, and like the US say, go fuck yourself. Sorry, code of conduct, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut. Um, and and, and uh, uh, the President Trump say, please go elsewhere, um, then what will happen is, yeah, we, we will be all in very uh, deep trouble. But normally, you have trust in an organization. Blockchain means that the trust is like disseminated, diluted everywhere, and so you trust the blockchain itself. But the blockchain itself has no value. I mean, it's really pure speculation. Uh, it's like bonds or whatever. I mean, it has no value intrinsically. And the trust you have in the organization is... So that's my opinion. Again, uh, we can debate among like uh, financial experts and I can, can give my opinion. But anyway, all or most of the blockchains Talks are about cryptocurrencies, that kind of stuff. And if you do Bitcoin, for example, the, the most interesting stuff you can do with Bitcoin is buy Bitcoin and sell Bitcoin. I mean, that's not that interesting. On Ethereum, however, what you can do is you can code. And that's the most interesting things in the world. If you are a developer, if, if you are a baker, not so interesting. If you are a developer, I am a developer. I hope I'm a good developer. I like to code. And Ethereum makes it possible for you to code on the blockchain. And then after you have written code, you can keep it for yourself or you can deploy it. So Ethereum, you can deploy your code as well. And finally, you can call your code from outside the blockchain. You can interact with the world. So that's why... I chose Ethereum to play with it. And this is very bad stuff that I did. I've written a long pile of text on my slide. As a speaker, you should never do that. But instead of, of telling it, because I have to remember, then I prefer to let you like read it. Um, and basically what it says here is that um, the Ethereum VM is a database, I will come to that just later, that's very important, and on the database you have two kinds of accounts. The first one is called in the Ethereum parlance the externally owned account, which means that it's you. I, I have an account in a bank, it's an externally owned account. The second kind of account is the most interesting, is the contract, the smart contract. And the smart contract is code. So that means that the smart contract can have like currency, can have money. So you can have money and code can have money as well. First concept of Ethereum. Um, so 
Basically, Ethereum, as I told, is just like a database. Nothing happens. If you have a database, you don't execute any request, you don't write anything in it, nothing happens. It's just state. It does nothing. But, as with a database, you can try to interact with the database. And so if you send a transaction to an account, something happens. If it's a regular account, well, you just wire money from one account to another. Congratulations. That's great. But if you call a transaction to a smart contract, then the code gets executed. And that is very similar to store procedure if you have done it a bit. So you can think about the Ethereum VM as a distributed database where every node replicates the whole structure and you can set transaction to it to call store procedure. So, so far it's, it's quite simple. Ethereum code, there is no such thing as Ethereum code. There is something called the Ethereum bytecode. And basically you have, I think, three, like more or less three solutions to generate the bytecode. Uh, the first that I will describe in this talk is Solidity, which is the standard language. And I think there is a Python-like language, which I don't remember the name because I never used it, and a C-like language. Um, but it's the Solidity is an ever-evolving language, and it's quite easy uh, to, to learn it. So it has some influences, um, and the interesting stuff is, is not like JavaScript. If you are a Java developer, it's good, because uh, Ethereum is statically typed, so once you assign a variable with a type integer, then it will stay type integer. Uh, you can also have inheritance. I won't show it into this talk, but you can use it. Um, it supports some degree of libraries and very, very small stuff. And uh, you can also define your uh, user type. And I think I've talked enough. Let's do some demo. So, I will try... Ah, interesting. Better? Not better. Better. Much better. Sorry about that. It's a bit small, right? Better? Okay. So, if you have no clue, about that kind of stuff, you don't want to install anything, you go to a browser, you go to uh, remix.ethereum.org, and you can already start to write some basic, very basic um, Solidity code. Um, I mean, even if you are not used to Solidity, do I need to tell you that this is an addition? No, probably not. Now you are a developer. So, um, what is interesting is the first line should tell you which version of the language that you are using. This is not so great because Solidity is uh, constantly evolving, so if you, don't, if you are not into the field, it, you, you might have some troubles. Um, so you should first tell it which version you are using. The second is you can see that there is no class. The top level element is not class, it's contract which is good because it's called a smart contract for a reason. Then you tell this is a function, you name the function, you pass the arguments. The visibility modifier is after the declaration. The returns keyword is mandatory. And here you tell which type you return, which is like quite similar. Now if we go there, we see that uh, our friend can compile the code, the browser can compile the code, and it tells me that the function state mutability can be restricted to pure. Are there any functional programmer in the room? No, two, three, or oh, guys? 
three functional programmers in the room, or are you shy? Okay, you are shy. Um, so do I need to tell you that your proof function, the return of the result of a proof function, is only dependent on its argument? You know about it, right? Yeah, okay, so there are many functional programmers, but you are too shy. Um, and that is very important in Ethereum, because, as I told you, Ethereum is blockchain, and you like write on the blockchain. And writing on the blockchain is like CPU intensive. You need to resolve some very, very uh, complex algorithm. And this requires a lot of CPU, and thus a lot of energy. That means that basically you are not writing on the blockchain yourself. You are asking someone to do it for you. You are asking a broker to do it for you. I will come back to that later, but just for your information, right now what we need to do is to tell it that, yeah, we, we, it's a pure function. So let's write it like that. So that means that there is no right operation. And now the browser doesn't complain anymore. Something very interesting as well is that we can give a name to our return parameter. That is super cool. Like in Java, the return parameter is a type. And most of the time, I would like to give it a real name because the name of the, the, the function is, is nice, but the, function, the name of the return parameter could be cool as well. Another difference with, with Java is that also what's what we can do is we can return like multiple values. We can return a tuple. So I will say a one, uh, sorry, and a one and a b1. So I will return the same arguments. A, oh no, a, b, like that. Oops. What did he do? No, okay. I don't know why. Look, everything is fine. Okay, that's that works quite well. And still, we can run that that stuff, and we won't run it into um, the real environment. We won't run it into a test environment. We will run into an emulation environment, a JavaScript VM that you can see here. So we can we we can create the contract. So it is magically deployed in the emulator, and afterwards we can we can try to to, to call it. Applause. <laughs> Thanks. That was quite hard, right? Um, this is how it works, and now I can I can decide to uh, let's say like get it back and remove those extra stuff. So I recreate another contract and here So if you have like five minutes, you can try to do that kind of stuff. It's quite easy. Remix.ethereum.org. So this is a bit of a sum up. As I told you, the difference is that you have contract as a top level block name instead of class. Well, that's not that easy. Um, you, have, you can have multiple return values. Uh, you can um, uh, name your return values, and lately you can have the pure keyword. And if you read something from the blockchain but not write it, there is a, a read keyword that is like a bit less than pure but still interesting. So, if I want to do like more interesting stuff, let's say that I uh, want to create. Ah. I want to do more interesting stuff. So, this is a bit more complex. 
a bit. Um, basically, what I, I try to do here is first I want to create a token, like really a cryptocurrency, but again, it has no value, it's only for me, I can give it to you if you want, it will be very interesting, you will be so happy to have your first cryptocurrency, look, look, I, I have a token, um, to, to emulate a sort of referendum. So a voting token is like what you will give to be able to vote on a referendum, and afterwards I can create the referendum contract. I, I, I don't want to, to like describe everything because it's a lot. Um, something that I find interesting, for example, is here the mapping basically describes a, a, a dictionary, a hash map, and a hash map of an address to and like you int to an integer. And this is how I keep trace of who the token belongs to. In your mind, probably if you have an account, you are the reference and you say that uh, on this account, I have like X of euros and Y of zloty and Z of dollars. But here it's reverse. It's the dollar who knows that this account has X of me, and this other account has Y of me, and this third account has Z of me. So that's the, I find that interesting. Here you can see that's how a constructor works. So I create the voting token and I say, there is a symbol and there is a, this total supply. So when I create the, the cryptocurrency, this is a cryptocurrency. I prefer to name it token, but it can be seen as a cryptocurrency. When I create it, I, I tell it how much it has, and I assign it to myself. I assign it everything. When I create, it's mine. And afterwards, I can like transfer tokens to another account, or I can burn them. Why? Am I so stupid to burn my own cryptocurrency? Like, it's worth million. Every one of those tokens is worth million, if you believe in that. It's worth million. Why should I be so stupid to burn them? Well, if you vote, that's how I model the act of voting. Basically, when you vote, you burn your voting token, and afterwards it's gone. You cannot vote multiple times, unless, well, you can model that you can like spend many votes on the, on the same vote. We, we can try it for, for, for a bit of fun. Sorry. So I will remove the mathematics. I will create the token. So the symbol, are there any people from UK in the room? One, yeah, you are, oh, come on, you are still Polish. So, okay, I, I, I will be something very politically incorrect. Yeah, I, I'm already burned in front of the camera. So, so I create the Brexit token. So afterwards, you can vote, and I create a referendum whether you want to, to go away from EU. So, for example, here I can ask the symbol is Brexit, the, the supply is 30. I can ask how much do I have. So I need my address. So I have everything so far. And I can burn some stuff. Let's say that I, I want just to try and I burn like 20 because I'm so rich, I can give two-thirds of it. And now if I ask for the total supply, no, please don't do that to me. Ah, thank you very much. I owe you some chocolate. Yes, thanks. I really owe you short chocolate. Um, and now if I ask the, 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 the balance of my account, now I have only 10 huh? because I just burn it down. Uh, something interesting also, that uh, I want the token to be used only by the referendum contract. So the referendum contract, when I create it, it takes the address of the token address. So only the contract can use the token. I mean, the token cannot be used for, for multiple stuff. So if I, have, I create the referendum contract, then 
afterwards. Uh, so the question is, do you want to leave EU? Uh, I don't remember what was the second stuff. Yeah, how many votes you can, you can burn every time. And the contract address here. And then now it's like deployed and then you can get the question, you can get the results. And, and, and I mean, th that's, that's quite easy. I mean, the, the modeling is quite easy. So basically every time you vote, you burn a token and then your, 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 your vote is written in the blockchain. Well, that's good for a sandbox, right? It's not that interesting. I mean, in general, if you are a software engineer, the next question is, okay, but how do we deploy for real? <laughs> because that's a JavaScript virtual machine. It's fun, but it's not that interesting. How can we play for real? Uh, how do we test? On which framework do we test? Do we deploy for real and then test it for real? Or can we have our own network or have a test network? So what I will do now is I will uh, try to deploy my uh, simple contracts on, on the Rickenby network, which is um, a very nice network if um, you want to get money, because everything requires money on Ethereum. I will show you how it works. So now this is perhaps a bit too... So here I, I've like started uh, my Ethereum client, which will basically connect to the whole network, and I am trying to get the transaction. I hope it still works, because I closed my, my well, yes, it works. And I will launch from that the wallet. So the wallet is, is a, like a rich client, really like a desktop one. And then it uses the result of the transaction locally, and I can have this kind of overview. So here you can see my account, um, and I will try to deploy a new contract. So for example, here you can see I'm not on the real network because I have so much money. I'm super rich. Um, there is um, an app where you can ask every, like, eight hours every day, every three days for, for some ethers. Ethers is, is, is an Ethereum currency you can ask, and then you can have them for demos. It's very handy. So I will create a new, not, not a new wallet contract. I will deploy a new contract. And here I will like, no, not this one. I will just have the math one because this one is easy. And I want to deploy Mathematic. And that's why I told you previously that now, in order to deploy, I ask someone for a transaction because someone will write down the code into the blockchain forever. And this is expensive, so I need to give some money for, to, for a broker. So if I'm poor, I can give nothing and hope someone will do it anyway. This is only true for the test network. This won't work in production because nobody is stupid enough. But since I'm very rich French guy, I spend everything and probably it will be done in 30 seconds. And now it tells me, hey, you are about to create a contract, blah, blah, blah. And afterwards, what I can do is I can like copy paste my password. And now I've sent the request, and if somebody has a, a, a watch, he can, we, we can try to watch to, to wait for 30 seconds until I've got confirmation. If I have no confirmation, then I will take one of the previous one because you are not there to wait until some, someone decides to, to write my transaction. Yes. So someone decided finally to write my transaction. Now I can use my contract. And as you can see, it's exactly what I wrote. So now I can pass some, uh, 
Sorry for that. Yes. This is code that is executed on the, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. The only difference is that it's not the production network. It's not where you play with adults. It's the sandbox. It's a test network. But it's the same code. It's the same code. So if something runs here, probably it will run in production. At this point, probably what happens is that you might have some problems with what I demoed because where are the tests? I mean, what I showed you right now is about like what we did 30 years ago. We deploy to production with agree without any tests. And uh, th th there is nothing out of the box with Ethereum. Basically, if you want to develop in Java, you have to use GUnit, which is not part of the GDK. And in Ethereum, it's the same. So what you need is to have something that helps you. And uh, on Ethereum, what I found is a truffle framework. If anybody here hates JavaScript, I'm sorry, because this is an NPM package. So you have to install NPM on your machine. You can do it on Docker also, but still you can, you have to write npn install g somewhere. Sorry for that. Um, the good thing about Truffle is it provides you, first you, it provides you with a structure of, of your, like how you should organize your file, like, like Maven does. It provides you with a way to deploy so that, for example, if you already deployed a contract, it, 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 takes, it, it um, keeps track of it inside the blockchain, and it tells you how to write your tests. So here, for example, it's not that one, it's here. Might be a bit small, but this is what I did, so I created uh, using Truffle in it the structure, and like basically it creates you like a smart contract called migration. You should keep it. You don't do as I did. You don't remove it because what is that? And the initial migration.js, which basically deploys the migrations, and this is how it keeps track of which contract you already deployed and which is the gap which you should deploy. And afterwards, you have some tests, and here you have some configuration. Now, I shall remove that. And I will go there, and I will go there, and I will clear everything. So here, what I can do is I can call uh, truffle with the keyword develop, which basically will create my own local blockchain if I allow something. So here now, I have my own local Ethereum blockchain, and I'm, I'm the owner, I can do everything. And by using the command test, then I will run all my tests on this local blockchain. And because I'm super good, comp uh, everything works. Now, how, what does... Uh, this is the example of the tests. So as you can see, it's JavaScript again. I'm trying to use the latest and greatest, like the arrow function, this kind of stuff, because everything on the Truffle uh, documentation is like, uh, let's use future, which is not that good. I'm trying to use async await instead of um, callback hell. But if you have done any JavaScript so far, it, it, it's, it's JavaScript, right? The only thing what I'm using is that I'm saying that um, I will create a, like a That's fun. Ah, oh yes, no, perhaps. Okay, so far so good. Let's say it's a warning sign. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm uh, creating like uh, a, a new, um, sorry, constant. Every time. It works? 
Yeah, oh, you will touch me again. Sorry. Wait, where is it? <laughs> I cannot find... Uh... Hey guys, we are... No, please. Hey, you, you are in front of everyone. You understand? Now I have to get back in the mood of, of talking. Um, so you can describe your, your, your test cases here, and what you can, you can see is, okay, I tell that the owner is the first account, and then I will create a new voting token, and I check that the balance is whatever, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is standard JavaScript stuff. Um, the, 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 um, if you are using the Mocha, testing framework in JavaScript, it is very, very similar to it. And, and it works. Um, you can see that I have the catch and the assert equals and everything that you would normally do. Um, now, if I try to do it into the ring by network, I will have to do truffle console. And basically, I will attach my truffle not to my own private stuff, but here to the Rikabai network. And now if I test it, I can already tell you it will fail, but I have to be authenticated. So now I have to like uh, check and let's say I want to unlock my account. So now it's on video, everyone's to have like 600 Ether can take it on video. And now if I test it, so here it takes a lot of time because I have to run it on, on, the, on the like test network, not something on my machine, but I need to synchronize with the external cluster and everything. Um, so in the end, it, it doesn't work. Because what I didn't do in my code is that uh, there are some r writing operations. I need to write some stuff. Like when you, you burn tokens, then you need to send a transaction saying, hey, I changed the state of the blockchain so that it, it has burned some stuff. Change the, the map. You remember the map where the key is the account and the value is the number of tokens you have? Remember it? Uh, I need to change that state and basically, this is, this requires money. So what you need to do in that case is that you need to provision money on it. And if you forget to do it, then of course, in the end, it doesn't work anymore. So I, I will uh, let you see it. It takes a bit of time. It's not that interesting afterwards, especially since it fails. Um, so this is done. Um, you can find the reference uh, on GitHub, this is the last line. You can uh, follow me or ask me questions on, on Twitter. And of course, you can read my uh, weekly blog on, uh, on myself. Now, uh, there might be some time for questions. I think we have 10 minutes, which is a good time. Has anyone any question? Yes, you have a question, so I have to run to you. Sorry again. So the question is how to acquire some gas. So the gas is what you pay when you want to write some uh, to to deploy your transaction uh, to your contract. Sorry, and basically it's it's uh, like a, a unit of ether. And um, so you go on this. So it's called faucet. Dot Ah, you cannot see, it's too bad. Shit happens. And here, you can beg, give me ether. Uh, yes, what you need also is you need, first you need to, uh, like, because we, we don't want any boats, you need to tweet to uh, Google, post something with, uh, like, the, um, an ID and then it can be verified, and then you can ask for Ether. And uh, if you are very, very smart, you can see that if you ask every eight hours, you can get free, but if you can uh, ask for one day, you get 
7.5. So it's better to ask every eight hour. Think about it. Other questions? Yes? Okay, so the question is, uh, why is it possible that anybody can burn my token? And that's a very good, very good question. Actually, no, it's not possible. Anybody can call it, but... Uh, where is it? Here. Um, the first thing that I'm doing is uh, I'm checking that uh, it requ the, the value that I want to burn is less than what the guy has. And only then I can do the stuff. And if I remember well, and I don't know where I coded it, uh, I think not everybody can do it, but uh, perhaps I didn't code it. But basically you can check that the guy who is calling you is the same as the, the account that you will try to burn it from, and otherwise you can fail. And you are right, I didn't code it. My fault. Other questions? No questions? Yeah, other question? Everywhere. That's the, the magic of the distributed transaction. So as, as you saw, uh, when I was um, deploying it, I was asking people to to do something about it. Um, where was it? Ah, I already closed it, so I have to do it again. So what, what, what I, again, I, I don't know, I mean, it's like you, if you ask me about a database, I, I know some SQL, I don't know about the intrinsics, how it is executed um, exactly, but what I infer is that since you've got the whole blockchain on your computer, if you have read operation, it's very simple, that basically it's executed on your nodes. Now if you have write operations, again, you ask for some proxy to do it for you, and then it gets replicated on your node, and you can like write it on your node. Does that answer your question? You pay when you write. You pay when you change the state of the blockchain. That's one of the most important lessons. Like, everything is free as long as you just read. And of course, when you want to deploy your, your, your smart contract, you write. So you pay. Yeah, then uh, if, you exec if you execute the bytecode that only reads or like the mathematical stuff doesn't, I mean, doesn't change anything, it's free. Because basically, you are executing the code on your nodes. And I mean, you are using your own computing power and... Other questions? Sorry. Yes? Ah, sorry, sorry. The guy behind you was faster. Okay, how do you look at all voting stuff? So, um, I don't have the URL, I, I lost it, but basically there is a dashboard when you can have every transaction of every contract that was ever deployed, and you can, like, it references the contract, like, wise, if you have, like, contracts depend, depending on each other. Um, and what I didn't show you, for example, when I wanted to automatically deploy the stuff, like the migration here, uh, here, as I, I, I showed you, like, in the, in the uh, JavaScript GVM, how you could, like, first deploy the voting token, get the address when it's, it's deployed, and then feed it to the second one. That's, that's what you do. Um, so this is a, f and if you do that kind of stuff into the blockchain, then, then you can look up on the dashboard and you will see that the referendum contract that is deployed at that address references this contract deployed at that address. Um, but everything is, is binary, so um, if you happened to stumble upon that kind of stuff, it's, it's possible, not so easy, but it's possible to get the initial code. That's where the, the difficulty lies. Other questions? Yes?
is there a single blockchain? Um, at, no, because basically, as, as, you, as you can see, I created a local blockchain. There is a rick and buy blockchain, there is a production blockchain. Now, if you say, is there a single instance of the production blockchain? Yes, and I have it on my machine. And if you synchronize, and you are part of the distributed node network, it will also be part of your machine. We will have the same instance. What might depend on the network is at which level of synchronization we are, but yes, we will run the same blockchain. Yes? So the question is, if, you, if you, I have a token and you have a token and we want to like exchange tokens, is it paying? Yes. It's like a broker, you need to pay someone to basically like write the transaction that now I have one token less and you have two token less. Nothing is for free if you want to write. Okay, we might be running out of time, so thank you very much, guys. And enjoy Geekong.